Right. Well, we've got John Hollow here of the Public Affairs uh, Office here at the Soldier Systems Center in Natick. And how are you today, John? I'm doing great, Nick. Thanks for uh, having me. Well, thanks for letting me uh, get into your office. I know you're pretty busy here and uh, all the things that go with it. And uh, uh, thank you very much for uh, giving me some of your time. I'm, I'm really interested, and I know that the uh, people out there in uh, America land uh, would like to know a little bit about the public affairs and uh, this great uh, garrison here that does a lot of uh, research and development uh, for the United States Army and, and also other branches. And uh, how long have you been here now, John? I'll uh, be nine years, end of September. And uh, what did you do before you got here, John? Uh, I worked at the Tradoc Public Affairs Office at Fort Monroe, Virginia, as a command information specialist, training and doctrine command. And uh, uh, you went directly to here from there? Yes, sir. And uh, how about if we go back a little bit uh, in terms of your high school? Uh, where did you go to high school, John? Uh, I went to Tyrone Junior Senior High School in Tyrone, Pennsylvania, population about 5,500. Wow, that's a small town. 189 in my graduating class. And uh, how well did you do in your graduating class, John? 141st. I was not, I spent more time hanging out and staying in trouble than I did uh, actually going to school. But I was there. I graduated. and What, what happened after uh, high school, John? <clears throat> I went to uh, Shippensburg University in Pennsylvania for a year and because I had already started broadcasting. My best friend's dad owned, my, owned the radio station in my hometown, so I started in broadcasting when I was 14. Well, you kind of liked it right from the beginning. Um, instead, of being, uh, instead of being out playing cowboys and Indians or all that stuff, when we were 10, 11 years old, my best friend's dad owned the radio station, so he had like a little pretend station in the basement. We'd play radio instead of doing that. And then what happened? I started on the air when I was 14, so I was... Uh, radio DJ from 14 to now, so I'm 51. It's been 37 years I've been on the air. I'll be 38 on January 2nd. Well, you served in the military. Yes, sir. Where would you serve in the military? Uh, did basic at Fort Knox, uh, AIT at Fort Ben Harrison. Oh, advanced infantry training, yeah. No, yeah, advanced individual training at Fort Ben Harrison, Indiana, back whenever uh, I was at the 46 Romeo. Actually, back then it was 84 Romeo, then we became 46 Romeo, which is the broadcast journalist. So the, your military occupational specialty was uh, right in broadcasting right from the beginning? Yes. Wow, that was great. They gave you, a, they recognized your background. Well, you've passed a voice audition, you've passed typing tests, and then uh, back then uh, the broadcast school was the second highest recycle and flunk out rate in the Army. The only thing that was tougher was DLI wow. because what? you had to pass voice and diction, you had to pass radio, you had to pass um, electronic news gathering, you had to pass studio operations. Um, to pass the broadcast school, you had to pass over 400 different pieces of the program. So writing a news story, writing a radio promo, being able to queue up records, and back then we had the records, um, being able to hit the ramp when you're talking on the air, um, run the switcher for a newscast, write your news report, shoot your news report, edit your news report, everything that you would do from filing records to post-production on a TV piece you had to pass, plus you had to do the voice and diction to make sure you're able to talk good enough. I feel kind of humble here because of all that background, and here I am interviewing you. <laughs> That's why I keep pushing you off, saying, well, I'm not, I'm not really the guy to interview. Oh, I just yeah, can tell everybody well, else's stories. I think you are the guy to interview, and that's the reason why I want to interview you and spend the time with you. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned ZDI or something like that. What does that mean? You, you, you used something compared to the, a higher-ranking communication school or something, a rating. Z oh, ZTI or something? I don't know what you I don't know. I don't remember ZTI. Yeah, but... Uh, it was the uh, recycle or fail rate at okay. the Defense Information School. You had to, it was DLI, Defense Language Institute. They were the only ones that were failing or recycling faster than the broadcast course back then. Okay, what did you do in the military? I was a broadcast journalist. Uh, 1988 to 1990, I did radio and TV at AFN Shape. Um, oh, Supreme, Headquarters, Supreme Headquarters Allied Powers Europe. I did the morning show. I also did... Uh, Excuse me, video work where I interviewed um, Secretary Weinberger. I mean, I covered NATO. Actually, had a civilian clothing allowance. Wow! So I would cover NATO, and you would see online 
ABC, NBC, AFN, CBS. I mean, we were right there. We had our spot on the NATO lawn like all the big networks did. Uh, shape has no, uh, basically no NCOs. They're all majors and up, right? Oh, no, there's a lot. I mean, right. we have, I was the only E3 on post when I first got there. <laughs> Uh, they actually have, um, you have your NCOs, you have your officers. There's a lot of, I mean, it's every NATO country, it's NATO military headquarters. So um, it was a great assignment. I was there for two years when I left uh, SHAPE. I went to Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. Uh, it's right when Desert Storm was getting, or I mean, Desert Shield was starting. I actually asked if I could go, be part of the AFN, affil- the AFN startup, because we knew we were going to do a broadcast network over there. And they said they already have that. I have my assignment at Fort Monmouth, so I went to Fort Monmouth. Uh, got there beginning of October, went home on Christmas leave, came back from Christmas leave, and I had orders to, pr- to uh, report to the Combat Pictorial Detachment at Fort Meade, Maryland. I was being deployed to Desert Storm as a broadcast journalist with uh, Combat Camera. Reporting from Tikrit. Reporting from Cobb Spiker, Iraq. Reporting from Contingency Operating Base Spiker, Iraq. I'm Specialist John Pitt. My job was pretty much to go out with these guys every day to see what they did. The balls of the Eagle soldiers are usually known for firing big guns at distant targets. I'm telling people's stories. You know, I'm telling the Army story, the soldiers' stories, which I think is very important. After fully put together, these HESCO barriers are filled with sand and become hard as a rock. I love what I do. I want you to think about that because it's a project requirement. I decided to join the Army because they had this job available, broadcast journalism. You should say auto white balance, okay. And you can zoom out like you just did there. I actually came to the Defense Information School, which is at Fort Meade in Maryland, where I learned how to do a whole radio show. Moved on to TV, where I learned how to shoot video, edit video, voice the script, and put together a whole news package, just like reporters do out in the field. Sons of Iraq can use these barriers for cover if attacked by enemy extremists with small arms fire. You can pretty much deploy anywhere in the world in support of all types of missions. The commissary needed to prepare for those new personnel. In the future, if you're going to do a stand-up and you want it to be 10 to 15 seconds, you need to realize that, hey... Say more things. Say more things. It's a very rewarding career, being a teacher, being an instructor, because you see how these people can not know anything about this career field, and they transform within four or five months. How are you going to do a working interview with someone who sings? Having Staff Sergeant Bentley here and having his experience that he has brought to the table from previous deployments, it brings that mentorship that that we need as younger soldiers. What is one way that you can help focus what you want? So I feel like my life has purpose and so I I like that a lot and I think the Army has, has provided that for me. I did two years in Korea. Yes. Yeah, and on broadcasting. Yes. Civilian. AF, AFKN. Yeah. As a as a soldier. Now, what is AFKN? Armed Forces Korea Network. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. You know the camera doesn't know these. <clears throat> right. Things, okay. And. Uh, Military Occupational Specialty Public Affairs Broadcast Specialist. Wherever there's important Army news, these soldiers are there, reporting vital information for the Army or the Defense Department. And Army broadcasters can be found behind and in front of the camera, on the radio, or in the control room, in the field, and in front of the public. For this MOS, you must qualify for a secret clearance, have a two- or four-year degree for an active Army enlistment, and have successfully completed a keyboard course in high school, a trade or technical school, or in college. Or, in lieu of that, display your ability to type 20 words per minute. You'll enlist for five years and attend the Defense Information School, where you must also pass a voice audition. Then the Army will train you in professional communication that'll include basic announcing skills, plus broadcast writing for news, sports, spot announcements, and the skills of Army Public Affairs. You'll conduct radio interviews, perform digital audio editing, even DJ your own radio show, playing popular music you select, 
plus the interviews and spot announcements you've made. Finally, you'll train in field reporting, where you'll train to operate a digital video camera, edit video segments, write TV news scripts, produce your own news reports, and operate as a member of a television studio team. After your initial entry training and advanced individual training, you'll work supporting military operations day or night, where you may be assigned to a public affairs office for news, features, and internet releases, or assigned overseas with the Armed Forces Radio and Television Service Network, one of the largest information and entertainment networks in the world. You may also work in a post-radio or television newsroom, reporting stories about Army training and community activities there. Serving in this MOS can help you transition from the military to the civilian employment sector. This job helps soldiers, their families, and the public learn about interesting aspects of the Army. So join us in Military Occupational Specialty, Public Affairs Broadcast Specialist. You got out of the Army after, what, 12 or 14 years? No, I, I did four. Four? Uh, whenever I got back from Desert Storm, I uh, went back to Fort Monmouth, uh, was working there until my first enlistment ended. Went back to my hometown, was doing nights at WPRR in Altoona. Um, radio station decided to go in a different direction. So I rejoined the Army, went to St. Louis, uh, was at the uh, Video Production Center for the Aviation and Troop Command back whenever it was in St. Louis. Uh, got an ex-wife there. And then I got uh, assigned to AFKN for two years. I did a year at uh, a year in Tegu, Korea, and a year in headquarters at Seoul. Well, <laughs> I'm laughing here because you you wrote you're really right down to earth. I mean, you know, <laughs> you, get, you see you see what you get. Yep. <laughs> now, I'm very impressed with some of the I'm very impressed with some of the things that are in this office here, uh, in this adjacent office also. Hmm. And I'd like to take a short walk around and. Uh, Maybe you could tell me a few things about this place okay. and what you get on the walls here. Well, um, the thing is, what you ha what I have on these walls here is a lot of work by a lot of people. Yeah. Um, here at Natick, uh, I'm very blessed to be working at the Natick Soldier Systems Center. If you think about it, we're the only place in the Army that touches every soldier every day. Right. We have the helmet, boots, body armor, uniforms, PT uniforms, Class A or ASU, the dress uniforms, um, the MREs. I mean. If you think about it, anything that touches a soldier on the skin out, it's researched and developed here. And then we also look at the skin in to make sure that the nutrients our soldiers get are able to give them the best performance possible on the battlefield. With what we do here, I mean, on the public affairs aspect, I mean, I've been very blessed um, to be the chief of public affairs here for almost nine years. And I've had some really good people work with me. Uh, Bob Reinert, who's retired now, he used to work at the Boston Globe, uh, was a civilian journalist of the year for the United States Army in 2010. Always had his camera around his arm. Oh. Always had his camera, always had his pen and his notebook. Uh, probably one of the best writers I've ever been associated with. Uh, Tazania Mouton, she was here for a couple years, put out some really good product. Um, Phil Fujawa, he was here. He was... Uh, a graphic artist and gave the design that our newsletter uh, needed to get to that next level. Um, Kelly Field used to be the uh, public affairs officer at the U.S. Army Research Institute of Environmental Medicine, and she was phenomenal. She was a great addition to the team. Uh, Alexandra Ferran, she was a intern who came here for a summer, summer and a half, a year, year and a half, and worked really well with us. Mallory Roussel. Um, Jeff Sisto's taken some photos for us and wrote a couple stories that have contributed to us. Um, and then there's some stuff we get from the Army, but most all the stuff we do is we generate from that group of people. And since I've been here, the first year was 2010, and we've won an award either at the Installation Management Command, Army level, or Department of Defense level, or the National Association of Government Communicators, which is all federal, state, local government communicators. We've won something every year since I've been here. And it's not all because of me. It's a great team, a lot of great people who have put some amazing stuff together. And the one thing that we're very lucky about is there are so many different stories to tell. I mean, we've told stories from the new solar garbage cans. Believe it or not, that was on the front page of Army.mil because Bob Reiner was an unbelievable writer and made solar people... Solar trash cans. Solar trash cans, solar-powered trash cans. You look at it, it's right outside our building. 
Well, we'll have um, to take a look at that in a future date. To the, just invited to MRE Pizza, which uh, is just getting put into the circulation right now. They found a way to make pizza last three years at 100 degrees, and now they're putting pizza in the MREs. Um, we in 2011 or 12, I've checked the year to make sure, but they decided that female's body armor was, they just had small, medium, large. And if you're a small man and you're a small woman, the body armor size is just night and day. So they're running with their body armor up around their ears. And when they're running, driving in the Humvee, it's bouncing up and down, bruising their legs and hitting them in the ears. So they decided to create female body armor. And it was one of Time at Magazine's uh, top inventions for that year. Um, so we've had a lot of great stories, a lot of great people, a lot of subject matter experts who've been great about sharing their stories with us. And I look at it this way, I have one of the best jobs in the world. I get to tell soldiers what the 1,500 soldiers and civilians here at the Natick Soldier System Center are doing to make their lives better. And whenever they come back from deployment and they hug their wife or they hug their husband or the kids mob them, they get the hugs from their parents and everything. Our shoulders get a little broader. We stand a little taller because we know the work that was done here helped make sure they were able to come home. So, some, now, uh, how about if we go around the uh, office here and you can show me a few things on the wall here and, the, and also in the adjacent room? Sure. So, um, the Army Journalism Competition is the Keith Elware uh, Army Journalism Competition. Keith Elware was a major general who was killed in Vietnam. And he's a public affairs general, so the Army has created the journalism competition in his memory and in his name. And it starts at the uh, command level, which is Installation Management Command. Uh, we're in charge of making sure the installation operates. And we've won something from Installation Management Command since 2010. First, second, or third, one way or another, we qualify to go to the Army level. And at the Army level, we've won... Uh, first place in 2013 and 2015. Where's that located, John? It's right there. Oh, my, right up in here, huh? <clears throat> if you see, two years in a row. these are the Keith Elwares. No, we won in 13 and 15. Okay. But this is the MCOM level where we won. These are, and this is my individual part. Um, but it's part of the team. I mean, everybody gets a team award, but these are the individual ones for me. Um, and then in 2013, we hit the trifecta. We won the MCOM level, we won the Department of the Army level, and then we won the Thomas Jefferson Awards, which is the Department of Defense Journalism Competition. What's and we took first place in that. Yeah, IMC, you said? MCOM, which is Installation Management Command, which uh, is our higher headquarters. Then we go to the Department of Army level, and then we go to DOD, and DOD's Thomas Jefferson Award is the best you can win. And we won that in 2013. What's over here on top of the board? On the well, door here? The well, there's some of the things I'm very superstitious about. I surround myself with um, people who I've loved and lost. Um, the picture right above the door is my mom, my sister, and my wife. And that was the first time my wife met, what, met my sister, and that's on our honeymoon. And right above it's the first picture of me and my daughter. And a picture of me and my wife on our wedding day. So I, mean, I always surround myself with people who I've loved and lost or people who've meant a heck of a lot to me and aren't with me anymore. So if you look right beside my, right across from my desk, that's General Harry Green. He was the Natick Soldier System Center commander here from 2009 to 2011. Um, became very good friends with him and his family. And we lost him in combat in Afghanistan four years ago on Sunday. August 5th, 2014. They have the street uh, named The after street that. coming on post is named after General Green, General Green Avenue. Okay. So right above, right here above the door, this rucksack, uh, Justin Fitch was an Army captain who was stationed here and, um, excuse me, had, um, he was the commander of Human Resource, Human, Resource Devel Human Resource Development Detachment, the HRDD. They are the 30 soldiers who come here and volunteer to, uh, be um, human research volunteers. So we
put them in studies to find out how a soldier does if they're carrying 100 pounds of ruck and on treadmills or how they survive how they do in 115 degree weather or something like that uh, all the protocols are medically assumed or medically proven out and there's no harm to any soldier and they can they can say i'm done at any time they don't have to go through the whole study they were at volunteers yes and they were at temporarily duty they're here for they're here from 30 to 90 days depending on the uh, length of the study so captain fitch was the hrdd commander and at one point in his life he was uh, stationed in iraq in 2007 uh, he was having a tough time he's in a dark place and he had his m4 in his mouth took the thumb off of uh, safe and moved it to fire and for some reason the four and a half pounds of trigger pressure did not go and he said he heard in his head his buddy who was killed in Afghanistan the day before, he heard his buddy say Fido, which in Army terms is F it and drive on. So he flipped it back to safe. And in 2007, if you had some sort of mental issue or you thought you were going to take your own life, you didn't get the psychological help that you get now. Back then, they would take your security clearance. You'd lose your position, and they'd start working on chaptering you out of the Army. But Captain Fitch went and got help through the chaplain on a confidential basis, wound up getting the help that he needed, and he vowed that he would make the world a better place. So in 2012, Captain Fitch was stationed here at Natick and was running. And then he didn't feel too good. It wound up where his intestines exploded because he had stage 4 colon cancer. And he said he was going to leave the world a better place. So in between chemo treatments and everything else, he decided he met uh, a guy who was created a charity called Carry the Fallen. So say, what say again. <clears throat> he created a charity called Carry the Fallen. And what they did is they would do rock marches the entire route of the Boston Marathon route with 50 pounds on the rock. He didn't come for the beaches and wasn't worried about a barbecue. He came here to walk. 10 News reporter Bobby Lewis is on the road in downtown Tampa where hundreds of others joined Chris to honor the fallen. Freedom isn't free. <laughs> Memorial Day is paid for by those who served, served, and paid it all. Looking back on her life and my, my friendship with her, she's a hero to me. And uh, that's what Memorial Day is about. The least we can do is walk. Why am I walking? I am walking because I am not from this country. So when I decided to serve was actually when I was in Haiti when the Marines came in to help out my country. So. I am doing this to honor all the fallen, you know, to respect the legacy and to keep the legacy going. This is the Carry the Load March, one of 33 Memorial Day 5Ks around the nation. This is a chance for us to honor our fallen brothers and sisters who went before us. It would be nice if there was twice this. Here in Tampa, over 600 people, many wearing their allegiance, all carried a load personal to them. This side here, this is my dad. He was killed October 1st, 1968 in Vietnam. I'm carrying Jennifer Parcells and Patrick Adel. He was in my son's unit. He didn't come home. My son did with PTSD. I'm walking for my friends that are still there deployed fighting for us. And also the friends I left behind over there. They started Rock. downtown. Because they felt that they needed to carry the weight that somebody else felt they couldn't because at that time 22 veterans were taking their lives every day. Now it's down to 20, but still one's too many. So as they would do this, um, he'd fill up his ruck and carry it on his back. That's Justin Fitch's ruck. We lost Justin uh, to colon cancer. He was 33 years old. Do you mind telling me how you obtained it? He left it in my truck. We had him. He was doing an interview with Channel 5, and he had his practice ruck with him. And we drove down to where they were doing it, and he left it in my truck. And I called him before he left. I said, hey, your ruck's in, my, your ruck's in the back of my truck. He said, keep it. I want you to have it. So it's right there in my, hangs on my door every day. So another reminder of somebody who I really cared for how and long, lost. How long was it when he left it in your truck and then he died? Mm, you're... It was about eight months before uh, he left the PC to uh, retire and go home. And, and at that time, you didn't really think. How didn't think about. It. I just saw I was taking up a spot. Yeah, and now it's something. Right now it's on the treasure. I treasure the heck out of it. It's a centerpiece of my office, oh. and right above it, um, 
Justin wanted wanted me to help him tell a story about how um, suicide isn't the end. That you can get help. You can. Your life means something. That. 20 veterans take their lives every day and he had that opportunity he had the gun in his mouth and he made something he made a life for himself he got the help that was necessary he wanted to make sure if one person got help and saved their lives because he told his story so the I, world's a better place that picture of the Minutemen. that is there's a story behind that justin hated football he hated football hated football okay <laughs> um but we were out telling his story we would tell it to all the metro west daily news ran stories the globe channels four five seven twenty five msnbc fox news the cbs evening news did their veterans day piece on his ruck march instead of the tomb of the president laying the wreath at the tune of the unknown so um the patriots called and said hey we're salute they were doing the salute to service Medal of Honor recipient Ryan Pitts was there, a few other veterans and stuff, and they wanted Justin, and I had to argue with him because J Justin hated football. I don't want to go there. I'm like, Justin, you got a captive audience of 70,000 fans. They're going to put you on the big screen. They're going to tell your story about what you're doing for veterans and soldiers to make sure that they reach out for help, so he finally did it. And while we were waiting, right after we got done with this interview and the stuff they did on, on, camp on the field, the Patriots scored a touchdown, and the commander of the Minutemen asked Justin if he would lead them whenever they fired. So that's Justin yelling, fire to the Minutemen. So it's something that I treasure. How did you get that photo? I took it. I was on the field right there. Uh -huh. I took that picture. <laughs> that was easy. That was a stupid question for me to ask. <laughs> uh, right beside him is uh, up on the top of the newspaper. That's my hometown paper I used to be the editor of. And that oh, is the Daily Herald. Daily Herald in Tyrone, Pennsylvania. And Okay. And that's Kerry Simpson on the top right. He owned the radio station I grew up working what at. What is that? Top right. Oh, I get you. I pick it. So his son was my best friend in elementary school. We bugged the crap out of him to let us be on the radio, and he finally did. And um, he was like a second father to me. And he passed away. Um, it was Friday. December 20th or something like that or 28th it was after Christmas so I think it was 28th or so. I can't see the date I don't have my glasses on. part of the things that I've been very blessed about is being a soldier and a civilian in the army you you get an education like I said I went to Shippensburg University for one year and part of that's because I partied too much and they my scholarship sort of went away but I've been blessed to graduate from the public affairs officer course, the intermediate public affairs officer course. I've been to the Georgetown Congressional uh, Operations Seminar, graduated from that. I've graduated with a master's certificate in public relations from Rutgers University. Um, matter of fact, we were the first class in the joint uh, intermediate public affairs course at Fort Meade for the Defense Information School. So um, we had a Navy commander who was the commandant of the Defense Information School at the time, so he gave us plank owner certificates like you would if you were on a new ship. Yeah, off the deck. <clears throat> yep, so we have a plank owner certificate from that. Um, this one is, these two really mean a lot to me. Um, whenever I was at Fort Monroe, the assignment before here, the Training and Doctrine Command, um, Fort Monroe's closed now, but it was a beautiful place. It was, had a working moat. Beautiful, uh, right on the water, uh, the Chesapeake Bay. But the one below it, this here, was presented to me by the Tradoc Command Sergeant Major who came off leave to come to my going away luncheon to present that to me. And that's the picture of the old Fort Monroe, whenever it was still... Way, way up the top? No, this one. Oh, this okay. is the old Fort Monroe. Wow. It's down, what, three years ago? Three, four years ago, I'm not sure. Yeah. It's been a while. Um, and then this one, I'm very lucky, um, Dave Sanborn, he was uh, our former master planner here at Natick, and he deployed to Afghanistan, um, I forget what year it was, but he, he deployed to Bagram as the uh, command sergeant major of the garrison in Bagram, Afghanistan, and um, made sure I stayed in touch with him while I was gone. And uh, whenever he came back, he presented both Bob and I with a 
flag that was made for us in Bob Reiner, R-E-I-N-E-R-T. But he presented that to us as a token of his thanks that we made sure we stayed in touch with him. I mean, I'm, I was so bad that any time I heard of an explosion in Kabul or anything like that, or if I heard something happen in Bagram, I hit him up on Facebook or sent him an email saying, check in, because you don't want to lose friends. They're hard to come by, and once you get them, you don't want to lose them. Where are those fooling way over the side of that uh, fire? <clears throat> uh, the one is whenever I became the morning show host at Tegu, AFKN Tegu when I first got to Korea. Is that the top one? Yeah. One is a Keith L. Ware Award from uh, the Department of, or the AFN Europe Keith L. Ware Award for Broadcast Journalism. And the other two are Radio Show of the Month from Armed Forces Korea Network. I mean, I've got my certificates of appreciation. I was the first uh, non-drill sergeant to grade the Drill Sergeant of the Year competition because we decided to put a surprise task into the Drill Sergeant of the Year competition with answer to the media. So they'd be in the middle of their land nav course, and all of a sudden, boom, here I am, and I'm peppering them with questions. We have a microphone and a camera hammering them. <laughs> I'm trying to stop laughing. But, I mean, you never know when the media is going to get to you. And you want to be prepared to give the right answer, tell the right story, be truthful, be honest, but make sure that you say the, say the right words at the right time. The one thing I didn't show you, Nick, that whenever I said about being surrounded by people I've lost, and that was my dad's racing jacket. Um, my dad was a pit crew member and engine builder for a sprint car team whenever I was a little kid growing up. And um, that was my dad's racing jacket. So I have a piece of my mom, piece of my dad, General Green, Justin Fitch, and Mr. Simpson surrounding me in this office. Who's Mr. Simpson? He was the guy who owned the radio station oh, I grew up okay. at, WTRN. So you had a lot of significant people that uh, you're very close to. Yes. And then the uh, my kids got me the dog thing over there with the, it's called DJ Jack Russell. Um, but my Father's Day present one year, the kids, my kids got me that uh, because being a DJ is my favorite thing to do. That's what I've done since I was 14. And I had a Jack Russell Terrier, so they found that piece of artwork called Jack Russell DJ. And um, I lost my dog since we've been here. So I mean, I've been very blessed with a lot of great things that have happened here, but I've had a loss, lot of loss since I've been here. Lost my mom, my dad, my dog, General Green. Uh, Justin Fitch, Mr. Simpson. So, I mean, a lot of key people in my life I've lost. And matter of fact, right now, um, one of the people I used to work with when I did commercial radio in Gainesville, Florida, um, she's 44, 45 years old, and they basically told her she has about a week to live because her ovarian cancer has spread so far. And she's got a 15-year-old son, 16-year-old son, and you just feel bad for them when you see people having to suffer like that. That's one. Uh, that's an artist's rendering of the car my dad used to work on. Really? Yep. Did they do that before you? Then, or did you ask them, or what? No, I was. They they did that. My dad worked on the race car. Oh. They gave the guy who ran the car. Um, they presented it to everybody who worked on the car at the end of the season one year. And that was, ha that was the one thing that was always hanging in my dad's house, no matter where he lived. That painting was hanging on a wall somewhere, and I figured, okay, that's going to hang on my wall somewhere, too. Did dad do this as a hobby or full-time? Well, dad was originally a mechanic, um, and then he had his own gas station. Then he worked for other people's garages and stuff, and whenever um, their garage closed or whatever, he started working for, uh, he was a, propane fuel guy. He did uh, installed heaters, um, gas grills, gas stoves, did that until he retired. I'm going to go over now to the TAHS <laughs> class of 1984, 25th reunion. Yep. Go ahead. So yeah, that's my graduating class from 1984, um, 25 years, so that was 2009. And the funny part is, that's the first one I'd been to. Uh, I missed the fifth, because in 1989 I was stationed at Shape Belgium. I missed the tenth, because in 2004, um, no, 1994, 
I was stationed in I was stationed in the Army at St. Louis at Aviation Troop Command, and uh, was about to get married, so I didn't go to my tenth reunion. Um, 1999 was my 15th reunion, and it was the first year they did the Pepsi 400 at night in Daytona. And so it was either a choice of going to my class reunion or go to the Pepsi 400 at Daytona, the NASCAR race. So I called folks from Daytona and said, I hope you're having a good time because it's a pretty darn good race. Um, my 20th reunion was in 2004, and I was on the radio in Milwaukee, uh, WKTI. And then my 25th reunion was 2009. That's the first one I've been to. And I've been to each one since. Well, John, we're in an adjacent room here of your uh, main office, and it's <laughs> subtracting room over here. Uh, what's this over here in the wall here? I see all these type of certificates and branding. Well, this, this is where the real work gets done. This is where um, my team uh, works with our partners across the installation to make sure we get the story told. And this is where their work has shined. Uh, as I said, we won something at the Installation Management Command, Army, DOD, or National Association of Government Communicators. We've won something at every level, either at some level, every year since 2010. So whenever I got here in 2009, these walls were blank because we had the Natick Soldier System Center had not won a journalism award in their 50 plus year, or 45, 50 plus year history at that time. And since then, we've won something every year. Um, we've won best website, we've won web publication, we've won digital publication um, at the Army, DOD, and National Association of Government Communicator level. And National Association of Government Communicators has the Blue Pencil Gold Screen Award, which is all federal, state, local governments are able to participate. So we're competing against anybody in the federal government, any state government, any local government, and our newsletter, NSSC This Month, uh, won first place in 2015, or 2016 and 17, and second in 2015. And then we put a year in review book together, which you got the last time you were here. And uh, we won first place for that in 2014. How about that Keith Ware Award? Well, Keith L. Ware is the Army Journalism Competition I told you about. So we've won at the Army level in 2013, 2015. This is our... Um, Department of Defense 2013 Thomas Jefferson Award, which is the best in all of DOD. I and, see Huffington even made the... Uh, well, the I mean, they gave, us, they gave us a certificate for Patriots Day, and it was really nice that they did it. We helped participate with that, so uh, I figured i got to put it somewhere, and I had a space. Uh, one of the things I want to show is, if you look around the walls here, these are the covers for our newsletters. And... Some of the stuff we've been able to do, we've talked and interviewed um, Medal of Honor recipient Carter, Sergeant Carter. We've uh, interviewed Sergeant Pitts, two chiefs of staff of the Army, General Odierno and General Milley, uh, Sergeant Major of the Army Chandler. We also had um, the current Sergeant Major of the Army has been here. Uh, we did a story on him last fall. Um, stories about Captain Fitch, General Green. I mean, we did a story about how we provide shelter to a, I mean, the Army shelters from force provider, helped the Navy as they were doing research at the Arctic Circle, um, how soldiers perform in different um, conditions, the crisis of suicide throughout veterans and our soldiers, um, new boots, I and mean, you look, all kind of stuff on this wall. There are some amazing stories that we've told in the eight and a half, almost nine years that I've been here. And I just am very fortunate to be able to tell somebody else's story and have great people to help tell it. I just try to stay out of their way and make and watch them do it right. Wow. What's the latest one? It's right here. Um, <clears throat> we're, one of the big things the Army's looking at doing is optimizing soldier performance. Um, the better the soldier performs under stressful situations and in all kind of conditions, and we need to be able to predict what kind of performance they're going to have. So it's a really important uh, Aspect. thing that our, our, our civilians and soldiers work on. I mean, we have soldiers in there who are volunteering to test. 
we actually have the dome in there where we do the virtual reality so you can see in different kind of conditions if we have them sleep def deprived or if we have them uh, hungry or whatever we can test them to see how they do in certain situations we put them in the virtual dome where they have the bad guys coming in around them and you got to find out whether or not it's friend or foe and they've got the weapon simulator and they shoot the wrong person you kind of get an idea of how that person's going to perform depending on the situation they're facing. And the best thing we can be able to do here is um, give the NCOs, give the officers an idea of how much sleep a soldier does need, how much food, how much nutrition, how much water they need to be able to keep at their peak performance. Because you've seen it in, like for example, you've watched many a baseball game. You'll see a pitcher go out there, throw six great innings. He goes out there and throws the first pitch of the seventh inning, and, they, and it still hasn't landed yet because he went one pitch too far, and it got launched into next week, and they lost one nothing. Losing one nothing on the battlefield, that's that's bad. You don't want to lose on the battlefield. You don't want to take the chance of that soldier being out there without being at their peak performance and be able to do everything they can. So we need to be able to inform the non-commissioned officers and officers and leaders, squad leaders, platoon leaders, making sure that they know where is the limit of making sure that your soldiers are at peak performance. I remember when we first started this interview, you said we touch every soldier. Every day. The, every day. It's the, the only army. place in the Army. This is the only place in the Army that touches every soldier every day. The only place in the army. Where else? We, we create the clothes. Uniform, helmet, body armor, boots. And we food. physically touch the soldier every day. The food, is, it's only when they're deployed. If they're in garrison, they're not eating the food. Or they're not eating MREs in garrison. But if they're sitting in garrison, they're wearing uniforms. So in reality, this is the only place that touches, physically touches, every soldier every day. They're wearing boots that were researched and developed here. They're wearing uniforms that were researched and developed here. PT uniforms, dress uniforms, helmet, body armor, all stuff that was created here. Research and developed here. The people who, the 1,500 people who work on this 78-acre campus, all they do is make sure the soldier has the best possible kit, whether it comes to the camouflage that goes into the uniform whether it comes to how the boot fits, how the boot sweats, making sure that your boots uh, hold up whenever you're out on patrol. You don't, need, you don't need your boot to blow out when it's on patrol, so we need to come up with requirements to send to industry to make sure things are done right. Well, it was a great time <laughs> to spend some time with you, and uh, I certainly would like to come back and... Uh, oh, no, you're banned now. <laughs> you, had your, you had your shot. You're well, done. Well, at least I had one shot. <laughs> you got your it shot. It took me nine years to get to this point. No. And I'm really grateful that you did spend some time with me. It Nick, really I, I want to thank you for the support you give the veterans, being able to tell veteran stories, because um, one of my favorite stories is um, I had a my history teacher in high school, Mike McNeil, as he was in the AmeriCal Division. And him and his wife were married from the time I was a little kid till the time I was, till now still. And um, I coached his sons in high school baseball, and Mike coached me in high school baseball, so it was really cool that we turned it around. But when I came back from Desert Storm, and I'm coaching Mike's kids, we're having a beer or two after the game at his house. Next thing you know, Mike's starting to tell me stories about the AmeriCal Division and what happened in Vietnam, and it was really interesting to learn. And when I got up to leave, Mike's wife gave me the biggest hug ever. I'm like, what's going on? She goes... I've been married to Mike 30 plus years, and that's the first time I've heard anything about the AmeriCal Division. So being it. able to share veteran stories with veterans um, gives them a chance to open up, feel that they're not by themselves, gives them the idea that they can share with somebody, and I appreciate you doing that for them. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, too. In the an AmeriCal Division in World War II, mm -hmm. the 26th Infantry Division, which is the Massachusetts National Guard, they were split in... Part of it went to the AmeriCal America Division in the Pacific, mm -hmm. and uh, it's, it carries on right. the tradition also. Well, Mike was in AmeriCal in Vietnam, so yeah. it's like I came back from Desert Storm, and it's like uh, I actually got a counseling statement from the two-star general at uh, Fort Monmouth, New Jersey, when I got back. Because, like I said, I played radio and TV, and I edited videotape and all that good stuff. So whenever I came back, I wouldn't put a combat patch on because I didn't think I earned it. 
So I'm living in a condo with other guys, and I run into the general. He goes, where's your patch? I'm like, sir, I don't deserve it. He says, it doesn't make any difference. I had to go to his office, get a counseling statement to say within the next week, if he saw me without a counseling, without a patch on my right shoulder, I would get an Article 15. Oh. So I went and found the biggest rent patch I could find. An Article 15 is what to the camera? Non-judicial punishment where you could lose two weeks uh, pay two weeks extra duty, possibly yeah. a rank. And cleaning toilets. <sighs> it depends on how they did. Yeah. But um, I went and found the uh, biggest weenie patch, almost the <laughs> most rear, the most rear patch you could find. I went to Third Army, and they were the supply support headquarters. So I put the Third Army patch on and okay. made sure I didn't lose any rank out of it. But General Millette was a great guy. He was a CECOM commander at the time, and um, it was really cool that the general thought enough to stop me and say hey make sure you wear your patch because you earned it you, you really find that the generals way up there are human there's a lot of them that are yeah uh, that's a good point there's yeah. a lot of them that are really human and, and humble too yep yeah well good luck thank you nick okay appreciate having you oh it was great having you it was a, it was an honor